We have a question here in the front and one in the back. So uh, please. Two. Oh, hey, I'm Victor Walmart, Albuquerque, Nuevo Mexico. Uh, it, actually, it's a comment. And it's a, it's a, like an an uh, optimistic comment. Like last year, uh, the, uh, the Oscar winning film was 12 Years a Slave, mm -hmm. made for $6 million. Uh, two male actors won for Dallas Buyers Club, made for $5 million. True stories, but based on true stories. American Hustle, based on a true story. Nada. Yeah. Uh, Wolf of Wall Street, based on a true story. Nada. Um, other great, you know, great true story films last year were, you know, 42, the Jackie Robinson story. Uh, Fruitdale Station, the story of, a, of an Oakland uh, murder, you know, uh, made for $900,000. Yeah. So, you know, the, ble the, the Hollywood is, good stuff is also coming out, mostly out of independent filmmaking. But, um, and the second thing is, you know, for $1,000, you can have a very nice drone and a Gro GoPro camera, and you can shoot anything you want to. You, know, you mean film? Film. <laughs> <laughs> video film, you know. For, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, for $300, you can get a very nice used block. You know. uh, and for like under $10,000, you can get everything you need to provide streaming video of anything that's happening anywhere. You want to be your own journalist? You know, you want to broadcast that there's a riot going on down there, you want to go shoot it, you know, for like less than 10 grand, you can be set up to do that and have really high quality stuff. Yeah. So just, but my story is where I've had the audacity to write a film about a Native American woman warrior, uh, Apache that is. And I say audacity because I'm not a woman, I'm not a Native American, but the Apache's like it. So I'm just putting that out there to let you know if any of you hear about it, I'm going to ask for your prayers and your support. Uh, I'm sorry that wasn't a question. The, the working title is Lozen, an Apache Woman Warrior. I used to call it Horse Thief, but they didn't like the name, so I changed it. <laughs> Victor, do you have a question? Oh, well, let somebody else Stand up. I have a question. Please. I'm from Portland. And the question is for you, and I didn't quite understand what you were talking about, about the... Uh, the well, there's a, there's a we were just trying to get the name of the film, the first name. We couldn't hear it here. Okay, great, thanks. I was uh, just trying to understand what you were trying to say about the internet and about the the wider uh, range rather than the up and down. I didn't quite catch that. The, the you know, I was saying it, it's, the story is purified because what happens is obviously somebody makes up a story. And in fact, in the traditional mythologies, um, the stories always are first and foremost an ecological description. So a myth is always begins with the ecology and geology of a place. And that that is the ground that then psychological material comes on, cultural material comes, all that is happening. Um, and it happens through time. And if one particular storyteller like puts in a, like a, 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 an untrue note, other storytellers will eventually cast that out. It'll just get cast out. So what is interesting to me is that that process, that happens over long periods of time. But now when we tell stories, so many people are involved, so many more people often than over those you know, hundreds of years are involved in working on a story together, um, finding that group story. So I'm interested to see if something like the same process that happens through time will begin to form our cultural stories, but more in a much shorter period of time because so many people in a broad way are working on it. So can you give an example of a story of a myth that's been purified? Mm. The, the old ones I can. I mean, that's virtually all of them. But the new well, ones... Well, just name one. I just want to understand, like, oh, oh, I okay. want to understand also what you're saying, because okay. I'm well, not sure I do. Um, I know I don't, actually. Okay. Uh, what's a story everybody knows? The story of Hercules. The story of Hercules is a story where, um, you know, the, it's, it's, it is a classic hero story. And the same thing when you go to film school and they make you read Joseph Campbell now and they've turned it into a formula that you almost have to follow on a lot of film. 
that, that formula was made through stories like Jason and the Argonauts and, and Hercules, and it took a long time to perfect the hero's journey type of story. And that's what, that, you know, so all the really old myths have gone through that process. And that's why the archetypes, the, you know, they have connected to what I consider a reality, a, a, the mythic imaginative, the mythopoetic level of reality in a way. Mm. You, the archetypes are sort of living there, but it takes a while to materialize them. And as I say, get the false notes out. You know, somebody allowed a detail and it's not really right. And, and it just becomes clarified until it really almost is a form. And if we're lucky, it doesn't become a stereotype instead of an archetype. We have Victor, and then we have this gentleman. Victor, stand up. Yeah, Victor Margolin, uh, City of Chicago. Uh, I want to go back to something that Paul said earlier. Uh, do we have a story about who we are as humanity and where we're going and why we're here that is contemporary, that isn't you know, tribal? or anything right. like that. Is anybody thinking yeah. along those lines and is it even possible yeah. to have such a story? So you want to address, you want to come up in, in a pop culture context, a Hollywood um, context, or a In a context that people take seriously in that they believe, yes, this is who we are and where we're going and what we're doing. I mean, it's, I feel like it's so dependent on the culture that you're talking to. I mean, I think speaking as someone from the United States, speaking loudly as someone from <laughs> the United States, uh, I think that it's a, pr it's a problem that you're bringing up, that there is a lack of a, a story with continuity um, that transcends the entire culture. I, th I find that the United States, for example, has an identity crisis because it doesn't have a story like that. Perhaps the closest story you could come to would be, maybe be The Matrix, which is just, oh, we need an escape from this commercial hell that we're in, and it can't possibly be real. But it doesn't necessarily state what that reality is, what we're here for, other than to somehow escape it. And maybe perhaps there is a beautiful truth in that. I think there is. But um, you know, I think every culture specifically has their own story. I thought it was so wonderful what everybody's been saying here about how important story is in terms of defining those very basic components of who we are, why we're here, and what we're meant to do. And, and Thinking and, and, about goodwill hunting and... Um, Excuse me. Yeah. Could people please stand? Oh, sure. And Speaking take of turn. Robin Williams, uh, I think of goodwill hunting and the one about him being a professor in a boys' school as being positive movies about a, a wholesome, love-filled life. And you know, I think that you look at Hollywood and you look at U.S. American culture and you see the violence and you see the patriarchy and you see that the story of the culture is, is not a pretty one. It's not one I even want to look at. But when I look at Mackey, Nate Mackey, who I talked about earlier, this story of beings attempting to become fully human, is this in purgatory, you think? Is this his imagination of what it's like before you reincarnate as a human? Or is this a story from this lost continent of Lemuria? You know, all these potential narratives are going through your head, and that requires you to sit down and take it in and use critical thinking, which is not something you get from your typical Hollywood cra car crash kind of movie. Did you want to, a couple want to chime in here? I, I, I just wanted to say, speaking of Robin Williams, the last, the last thing I, re, uh, the last thing I remember is the last commercial that he did, which was like a, a 30 second spot for iPad, which was basic, the basic story of storytelling, where at the end of, for i for Mac, I guess, of, or for Apple, um, it was a seri It was it's a like a serial poem, and it ends with and you can contribute a verse. Um, I think that asking for a universal answer for a story is kind of just almost, I, and, I, and I'm not trying to be um, flip, I, I, think it's, I think it's very American to ask for this universal story. There's so many more stories than the American story and that I could really, really get into 
and I'm, Amer I'm as American as I am African, as I am Venezuelan, and all of, all of these things, it's just, I, I just think that we can all contribute a verse. Yeah, I wanted to say uh, one film came to mind from a few years ago called Babel, which was a film that attempted to show that in parallel, at the same time, we are linked to each other across cultures. And I think a few more of those types of films have been coming through, which shows our more global mindset. And there's one that you can look out for because the, the book was beautiful. I wanted to even look at the possibility of buying the rights, but Nicole Kidman has good tastes. <laughs> uh, it's called The Other Hand, and it's a, it's a story of a middle-class English woman who gets touched and touches the life of uh, a, a young African girl. And a look out for it. I think it is our world at the moment. I see that Lawrence had his hand up. Lawrence, you still have a question, and we have one in the back, and then we have one here. So I see a right hand. Uh, I just wanted to hear more about the storytelling from the human force, because uh, I've become quite cynical about stories, I realize, as I listen, because all stories are valid, um, and all stories um, are serving something or convenient for something. And actually, if you look at Iron Man and all those um, sequels and prequels, they work because they do tap into ancient myths, Hercules and so on. So I'm kind of like, well, either all stories are good or all stories are bullshit. Um, and it's probably both. So, so I'm, I'm kind of waking up when I hear the idea that some stories are better than others. Is that really true? Do some stories come from a different place? Uh, the purified myth, the human force, I want to hear more about that. Matthew, you addressed this, I think, before. The, the, you know, the, the yeah. two divergent paths, maybe that's something to do. All right, so I think one, man, there's so many good topics that have been brought up. I don't even know where to go from here. Right <laughs> um, no pressure. No, no, I don't feel it. A real bad story is the story of why we're at war. So I think that was one that is really significant. Yeah. There is, a, um, there is a, another story, of, 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 I call it the BS story, which is that some stories are just entertainment. And I hear that all the time, living in Hollywood, uh, dealing with the executives who don't want to hear original material. I'm literally told, please bring a book that you have the rights to so that we know that this is going to have an audience that we can sell to. And I don't, I'm past the cynical stage. Now I'm just compassionate with everybody's story. And so I'm trying to bring things to them that fit their framework, but that do have content. Um, stories are never just entertainment, ever. They always have some underlining morality or message, no matter how um, little even the author herself or himself thought they did. So I think it's up to you to feel what is this story telling me? What values is it imparting? If it's Arnold Schwarzenegger's true lies, isn't this a story of absolute chauvinism? If it's the story of Forrest Gump, and my apologies to those who love that American film, if you actually look at it, isn't this a story that is absolutely right-wing, manifest destiny, <laughs> horrific propaganda that the artist himself has no idea that, that he and she and all the other people who are involved have created? And so why do people go, oh my God, Forrest Gump is my favorite movie, is because it's oh, making them feel so good about I don't have to do anything or think about anything. I, I can forget all of the huge polemics in American history the, from, from slavery to the Vietnam War to everything and just buy into the capitalist American dream and I can be the, the, the CEO of Bubba Gump Shrimp Factory or whatever the hell it is. And I never have to look or do any of that critical thinking that you're talking about. So. Would I call that a bad story? I think you, you can guess what I think of that movie. Um, I, I never know what you're going to get. 
Yeah, and I'm, just I'm, a box of chocolates. <laughs> I'm reminded of a teacher who told me that more people are united by their prejudices yep. than anything else. And I think that speaks to what you're talking about. We had a question in the back for a long time. What's your name? I'm Zuleika. I'm from Colorado, the United States. I just I have a, a comment and a question. I wanted to give my sort of short answer to Victor's question. I think maybe our global story is now turning into um, like an environmental story where things are happening that we feel we don't have a lot of control over and um, we have to learn how to adapt to it. And that includes everybody in the world. Um, climate change affects everybody. And I think that as it progresses and as we progress as human beings, we're going to find that we have a lot more in common when we need to band together and, and learn how to adapt to this new world, because it's going to happen faster than, than we would do it in nature. Um, and then just a, a quick question. I listen to a lot of story podcasts. I listen to Radio Lab and This American Life and Snap Judgment and Vinyl Cafe. And as storytellers, do you find that there's more excitement now, like from the beginning of your career to now? about stories, about hearing everyday people's stories, nothing special, but just people telling stories? Is that your experience as storytellers that people want to share? And is that growing? I, I feel like it is because I, these, these podcasts are new to me, but I'm just curious what you all think. I will say, oh, no, 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 I'm a psychologist on the other side, where I earn a living, and um, there's, there's one phenomenon that's experienced as negative, but I, I think has a positive subtext, which is reality TV. We're watching each other all the time, and I think a good quality of reality TV is, uh, or at least the intention or the desire is, I want to know who you are, and I want to know how you live this life, because it is true, it is hard, and the world is falling up to pieces, and how do you deal with it? because I need courage. And I think that's the positive intent of reality TV. It doesn't quite come across like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but all, you know, but I'm also, an optimist. But also, you how will you about? sell yourself out is an important yeah. sub theme in a lot of this. Where does your integrity end and what compromises that? Yeah. Is often, you want to say something? No, I think start that... start fighting on the panel. <laughs> I think that I, I, I agree with Myrna and as a person who's... Uh, has worked in television for a really, really long time and now have ha decided, I decided five years ago when I got laid off, I said, you know what, I'm not ever going to do anything again that I don't want to do that doesn't really fill my heart with what I feel I'm supposed to do. If I don't receive it, I'm not doing it. And, um, Reality television and living in Washington, D.C. <laughs> reality television. Um, there's been a lot of reality television that has come through D.C. And then D.C. is your new, is your uh, nonfiction capital, or we like to call D.C. Docuwood. So everybody has to come to D.C. because all the experts live there. All the liars live there. All the truth tellers live there. All, you know. Everybody has to come there because, you know, it's the center of power for the United States. And so I love the fact that there's all these factions of storytelling available to everyone. And within a moment's notice, you, you don't have to rely on the liars or the truth tellers or those types of things. You can actually rely on yourself or your son, or your daughter, or your, you know, or Paul Nelson, or Nora Foa, or any of us within the group to get a side of the story that um, you may be more able to trust. And so I think that that's the heart of resistance and activism, and I think that that's really um, beautiful for the era that we live in. You had a question. Hi, I'm Mary Balgan from Cebu, New York, and um, I know that we've been talking about storytelling through film and such, but from my perspective as a technology teacher, I believe that a lot of the stories, especially through Twitter and hashtags, um, you're talking about that community where people come in 
if you hashtag something, you become part of that community that has 140 characters. It's a powerful story. I mean, I have my students all the time. Tell me something in 140 characters. And it's going to be powerful. And hashtag it. You have to add the hashtag. Because the hashtag could be any amount of letters, right? But if it's more than 140 characters, including a statement, how can you really get your story across? So I know that that was just a statement I wanted to say. So you don't have to tell a story to film only, but the social networking is a great way to tell stories. Second thing is um, Blogspot, which is through Google. And um, I use it randomly for like, how I feel and I do a poem. Um, and I'm always trying to write a story. I don't know how to write a story. Literally, like, write the story and then give it to Hollywood. And you're talking about women and are underrepresented, underrepresented in Hollywood. How do you get, how do you break through that? Because I know there's this stigmatism of, okay, if it's not gonna be blonde hair, blue eyes, or, if it's not gonna be pop in a way that's gonna attract many people, they're not even opening the door for you. So how do you fix that? I'll tell you when I've got there. <laughs> 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 I seriously intend to get there. <laughs> a little different, okay. So you asked a question. Yeah. How is a person like me, Miriam, going to do this? Yeah. How? Miriam asked a question. How is a person going to do this? <laughs> you will answer that question for us. Yeah, I'm Sandy Renner from Boston. And uh, as a reluctant member of the older generation, I'm, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm struck, I'm confused. And so uh, what I'm going to say isn't well formulated, but I suffer a lot from what I call information overload. And as I hear each of you speak, and you're each wonderful at what you do, I'm thinking that I don't have the time to even look up what you've done. And I see my grandchildren who are just overwhelmed by information. And I wonder what that's doing to the development of the self. Because I grew up enjoying time that was quiet and in nature, and I didn't have all this input. And I just wonder what this is doing to their psychological and emotional development. And I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit scared about the power of the media and the very thing that you all are depending on to some degree to share your art. My feeling at this stage is I don't want to go on YouTube and try to find something that might resonate because there's so much garbage. I'd rather go out into a field with my own camera and commune with nature and have something that's meaningful for me and I don't care if anybody else ever sees it. And if somebody else does see it and likes it, fine, but that's not why I'm doing it. I'm not doing it to make a living. Uh, but it scares me that the technology is making it seem like it's important to tune into all these different sources. I, I, I mean, it, it blows my mind. It seems so redundant, and it, it's taking people away from being who they are. Now, you're obviously people who, through the Lati Han and the Subud, have developed a certain amount of understanding of self and you're coming from that place. But I think for the vast majority of people, uh, I'm a little bit scared. It seems very chaotic. So in terms of the future of storytelling, it seems to me that it comes down to each individual discovering for himself what his story is and learning to use it for self-development and not, and not have to be commercial or professionalized. If you don't decide what your story is, it will be decided for you, right? So it's important to do that. And it's also important to recognize what your story is because if you don't like it, you can change it. This is what they talk about when they mention personal mythology. Regarding the kids, there's a woman named Gloria Di Gaetano. She lives in Seattle, actually Bellevue. She's a media literacy activist. 
and all this watching violent video games, violent TV, she's an expert on it, and it forces people to live in the more animal part, the lizard part of their brain. The antidote for that is literature, is engaging the imagination, which is why Diane DePrimo was right when she said the only war that matters is the war against the imagination. All other wars are subsumed in it, right? So we don't buy the industry-generated cultural narrative, you know, we have to find our own. We're in an era that Peter Russell, he, he has this great graph in his book, The Global Mind Awakened, or something to that effect, and it's a list of the, a graph of the American economy over time from 1776 into the future, and the most important things in that economy in terms of jobs and, uh, and revenues. Of course, it was agriculture till about 1900, at which time it was eclipsed by agriculture processing or industry, the cotton gin, the reaper, that kind of thing. That reigned until 1975, at which time information became the main thing. And each time the graph is a little higher and the last one starts here and goes whoosh, and it's called consciousness processing, right? Those websites that have a specialty, whether it be dancing as was indicated earlier. The translator is struggling. Sorry. Go slow. To say two things, yeah. Master Spicy, no, please. We love her a little. And, uh, and uh, the other, uh, that uh, if I may do a comment on this topic, I think is, uh, I think there in, in today's world it is happening two things. Like there's a, a, a type of art that really dumps <coughs> down the, the human soul and traps it in a bubble and makes uh, illusions become reality for people and people are now living in a state of uh, you know, fiction life, really. They believe, they are friends with uh, you know, Justin Timberlake or they know Robin Williams, but they don't. You know? and, uh, and there's another kind of artist that they, they try to uh, reawaken the human soul and uh, I think that's his link with really a kind of magic of, of how you know uh, things are are alive. Really, everything is alive, and the artist is conscious of this. And they, I think they are, the the artists have the the the. I would first. Uh, where <laughs> was it? <laughs> the the artist will. Uh, I mean, I mean, it has the the. Um, obligation of not doing what the people want, but what the people need, mm -hmm. and that is lacking. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. I feel like, uh, first of all, the in rego regard of what she asked of how these stories with real content can get to the media. <laughs> I think there's um, like a, a big scam, uh, like uh, how do you say, uh, like a. Uh, Conspiracy? Uh, it's not such a conspiracy, but I think it's uh, like a um, like a fraudulent uh, 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 in the university and the in this uh, for the studying, for example, of art. For example, many people in Chile, uh, where I belong, and many people in the world doesn't know anything about uh, how the process of of uh, distribution in cinema works. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, there's a lot of filmmakers, but nobody can get to uh, to 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 make mm -hmm. the films get some uh, of the you most know, beautiful content what? in the world comes from Chile. Huh? Some of the most beautiful content in the world comes from Chile. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what, what, I, what I like to say is like I'm, I'm uh, just another thing. But I really don't believe, uh, and I'm really uh, disagreeing with the, this, that the technology is the future. I believe that, I, I actually think that humanity is divided, and uh, one part of the humanity is going towards uh, the material uh, technology stuff, and the oligarchy is like, uh, uh, make, making like this like sensual thing that you have to have the iPod, the Facebook, the blah blah blah. But in reality, I think the the, the future for me of, of storytelling is uh, what Babak did. That is the content, the real content. 
and maybe it's not gonna be with cell phones and cameras and maybe it would be more simplistic because I think the society is dividing in this uh, well, where people or you like content, real content, <coughs> or you like real BS uh, storytelling. Make and sure you get a copy of that statement because that's exactly what he said in his statement. So make sure you get that. And we have a copy of it here for you. This lady in the front has been very, um, very patient. And if you'd like to stand up and tell you, tell us who you are. Do you need to translate everything you just said to us? Uh, Are you going to translate now eh, to your prosecutor? <laughs> <laughs> we have a question here in front, and then we, can go, we have a question here in the front, and then we can go to her question. Okay, please. Do I need to stand up? Yeah, please. Yes. Um, I'm Maria. Um, I'm going to bumble my way through this question a little bit. I've been because I've been sort of picking up on what other people have been saying whilst thinking about the question that I want to ask, and um, it relates to this idea of, of the future and how we're moving towards the future of storytelling. And um, and my interest is actually in the point in the in the pivot point in the reader, um, and I don't know if much has been discussed yet. I came in late. Um, but I don't know if anything's been said about, about the, the position of the reader in interpreting the story. And this relates a little bit to the information overload point, and also I think a little bit to the idea of like stories that come from a true place, or do we read from a true place? It seems like in order for storytelling to transform, it's first... First, we need to learn to become true readers, like to read from a true place. And I'd be interested to hear what, what your, your opinions are on the pivot point of the reader. <laughs> Anyone ready to jump on that? <laughs> I, I, yeah, um, I, I, oh, sorry, sorry. We're answering the first question. Um, I, I agree that, that the whole point is that a story is, is given and received. I mean, if there's not the circle, um, it, it, there really isn't a story to me. I mean, it's, um, it's possible to certainly produce something that for whatever reason isn't seen or isn't seen for a long time or, or heard. But I'm not sure you even have a story if there's not a reader, if there's not that circle. And the... Um, you know, the capacity in the Larihan in, in, all, in all ways, when something comes toward us, that we are refining our discernment all the time about whether that is junk that's coming in and really we should sort of resist or try to get it to move quickly, or whether it's something really for us, I think is the crucial thing in, in storytelling, but really in everything else too. And the refinement of the reader, or the refinement of the watcher, or, or whatever form that they're taking, um, also allows the teller's voice to, to refine. When you're doing something and people really receive it, and they're able to, um, to both receive the best of it, but also to resist you um, when they think you've gone wrong, it, you know, it, it's a virtuous cycle. It, it just makes things really work when both both parties are doing their best to to be refined and discerning what is human. Um, and, and I think any good art, you can come to it at one time and come to it later and get more out of it. Read Siddhartha when you're 15 and read it again when you're 50, and there's so much more that you can get from it because you're a different person when you come to it 35 years later. And, and if I can add, in film, you get a finished product and everybody receives it differently. When you read something, you put your imagination in it and there's much more involvement of the reader. Uh, you're talking to quite a lot of filmmakers, so you're getting a biased view. We're not thinking of the involvement of the reader that much. But as a psychologist... Well, reader is a term for No, but it's a great challenge because in film, you do less reading, in a way, I think, and in other forms, you do more. And in conversation, as a psychologist, I know that if I'm open and non-judgmental, I will get the story, the real one, of the other person. And I think that's an important aspect of storytelling. If in our conversations we want to get each other's real story, 
we need to listen in a completely different way. Mm. In, the, in the back, uh, Senor, your Is there question? Can I quickly add one point to that? Very brief point? Or do I need to stand up again? <laughs> <laughs> So I just want to um, say in that that it, that it actually changes the question of what is a good and bad story as well. This idea that there is a good story that you can get a good message out of and there's a bad story which you can't get a good story out of. It's actually, it, it actually does away with that a little bit, I think. It's such an important question, I think. Um, there's a correlation between the time that working class people across the world developed the ability to read and that reading wasn't just an exclusive right of the royalty or hierarchy in church and so forth and you see the rise of democracy and power, people power, when they're actually able to read for the first time, it's an incredible empowerment. So in the idea of reading, as you're talking about it now within the context of the film, it's really important for us in order to um, be readers, discerning readers, to have a, an ability to decode what it is that we're looking at. And whether that's intellectually or spiritually, that it's an important facility to have to know what is this story touching, why is this story touching me and what part of me is it touching? In the back, senor, the question. <laughs> I don't want to do questions. I want to make a recognition. I want to answer questions. I want to answer the questions. I want to answer the questions. I want to answer the um, because of because of us, um, she's able to see the reality within fiction. Y a la vez esa se and sometimes um, uh, fiction turns into reality. A veces quisiéramos ustedes los que hacen cine o hacen documentales se pareciera mucho a los a los músicos porque quisiéramos eh, culpabilizarlos o quisiéramos eh, como volverlos responsables de los problemas sociales del mundo y no puede ser así. Um, so a lot of times uh, the filmmakers, the storytellers are take on the ills of society that uh, just like musicians do where we want to change the way the world is by our art um, and we shouldn't carry such a heavy load. Entonces a veces se les pide que hagan denuncias ecológicas, sociales, políticas de discriminación, cuando realmente ese no es su papel. And sometimes we do things about discrimination, about uh, eco ecological issues, about psych psychological issues, and sometimes that's not really our story. Cuando lo único que ustedes quieren es justamente a través de ese trabajo investigativo, porque para hacer trabajos documentales se requiere investigación, no solamente algo, algo sin importancia, sino que se requiere investigación. Por lo tanto, ahí está el sentimiento, está el alma, está el espíritu. And we're, we're the history keepers, we're, we're the investigators, we're the ones that um, look into the story. We don't have to actually take the story on in our being, but more so be these investigators, these observers. Por lo tanto, uno ya comienza a ver que hay un trabajo espiritual, un trabajo de su voz en la honestidad de lo que pueden hacer. Mm -hmm. And there's a great work in the um, spirit of Subud within the work that we do, um, and it's the work of spirituality. Thank you. Paloma, I'm from Colombia. Mm -hmm. Paloma. Mm -hmm.
more question, and then what we're going to do is just allow you to talk to the panelists and talk with each other. So let's let's have this final question. I'm Mardia Simpson from Australia. Um, this isn't so much a question, just a piece of information to share because I'm an information junkie. Um, <laughs> in Australia, this has been developed in recent years. From it initiated in the city of Adelaide, uh, a therapy called narrative therapy. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe it's also overseas, but there were some pioneers of that project that have developed it and have a training. And I know people who work in disadvantaged communities in other parts of Australia have undertaken the training, brought it back into their practice. And as I understand it simplistically, they work with individuals or very small groups, disadvantaged people, young Aboriginal youth, refugees, maybe some who suffered torture and trauma, a whole range of disadvantage still in Australia, although we're perceived as a developed wealthy country. And as I understand it from someone who's done this training seriously over two years and brought it back into his practice, people get trapped in their own stories. As given them by society, they're stereotyped, or the pain and the horror of what happened before becomes their sort of cage, their story, and working within the narrative therapy process. There, it's able to be reformed and reframed in a negotiation and with a supportive way so they can actually perceive and understand themselves in a different context that allows them to kind of break through into a new way of being. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I just thought I'd share that. Maybe other countries have that process in place, but story being used as therapy and in a healing capacity, I believe, is also a really yeah. useful show. Mm -hmm. Is there a last question that we can go on on? Is anyone talking? <laughs> no, with that, with that said, this... First of all, thanks to Andrew Hall for recording this. Um, very grateful. I'm grateful uh, to Subud to be part of this community every day, even more grateful, and grateful to the people of the city of Puebla because this has really have been an amazing Congress, and I'm very grateful to the people of Puebla. And let's have a hand for this panel.